our speaker. So tonight we have Philip Zelkow, and he'll be talking about this book here, The Road Less Traveled, The Secret Battle to End the Great War. And he received his BA in History and Political Science from the University of Redlands, a JD from the University of Houston Law Center, and an MALD and PhD in the International Relations from the Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy at Tufts University. He has many books, including Germany Unified and Europe Transformed, that was also co-written by Condolina Rice, Suez Deconstructed, and To Build a Better World, also co-written by Condolina Rice. He's a former career diplomat who was the executive director of the 9-11 Commission and worked on internal policy from Reagan through the Obama administration. Currently, he is the White Burkett Miller Professor of History at the University of Virginia, where he lives. So I'll turn it over to you. All right, thank you very much. Um, and it's a pleasure to uh, visit with the fans of the Hudson Library and Historical Society, but I suspect are also just fans of good reading. And the, uh, the book that I'm uh, talking about is really a quite remarkable story. I, uh, I've worked over the years on critical episodes in American and world history, and I've also spent a lot of time in and out of government. And this particular story um, is one of the most remarkable historical stories I think that I've ever had the opportunity to work on. And I think one of the most important discoveries I've encountered in my career. It is the secret story, the understory of how and why America got into World War I. But it's also, if you're interested in world history, it's the story of why World War I did not end at the halfway point. Uh, the story in a way just begins in August, 1916. In August, 1916, um, it turns out that the king of the of king of Great Britain, George V, went to northern France to visit the military headquarters of the British commander of the armies in France, a man named Douglas Haig. While he was there, King George had a meeting, one on one, just the two men alone, with the president of France, Raymond Poincaré. Poincaré was the famously nationalist leader who had united France in the war effort. The meeting was extremely secret and it was extraordinary. Poincaré secretly confided to the king to be relayed back to the British government that uh, France was ready to end the war. This is August, 1916, halfway through the war, two years in. It had been an awful year. Uh, this was the year of the great bloody offensives that we now remember as Verdun and the Somme. In fact, the guns from the Somme offensive could be heard in the distance as the King and Poincaré were talking. Poincaré said France needs peace as soon as possible. He expected actually the peace would be mediated by the American president, Woodrow Wilson, and he expected Wilson to make his move later that year, probably around the fall of 1916. Poincaré said when Wilson makes his move, we should be ready to state terms and find a way to end this war. He said that the French public uh, greatly uh, did not understand how bad things were. And that in fact, not only were things difficult for France, but they were also very difficult for Russia which was on the verge of imploding. He thought Russia was on the verge of collapse. And in fact, that was prescient because seven months later, the Russian revolution would bring down czarist rule in Russia. King George V reported all this back to London. And in London, he found a quite receptive audience for these worries for their own secret reasons. Uh, Britain had realized that it too needed to find a way to end the war for lots of reasons, including the fact that Britain was running out of the dollars to sustain the Allied war effort. They too were looking to, Wilson, to Woodrow Wilson. It turns out that at the same time the British and French were having these discussions, in the middle of August, 1916, the German chancellor, Theobald von Bettmann-Hollweg, 
drafted a secret telegram that he sent to Woodrow Wilson. It was actually Germany that ended up making the first move to literally ask the Americans to mediate the peace. Bettmann Holweg sent his telegram about one week after the French president and King George V had had their secret conversation in Northern France, also in the middle of August, 1916. It was a coded telegram. It went first to neutral Sweden, then relayed from neutral Sweden to neutral Argentina, then relayed from the German embassy in Argentina to the German embassy in Washington, because the British had cut a lot of the transatlantic telegraph lines that could connect Germany directly to America. There, the German ambassador, a very able man, von Bernstorff, got the telegram and proceeded to launch the peace move, asking Wilson to bring an end to the war. Wilson had been waiting all year for someone to ask him to do this, and he was ready to move. Germany was ready to compromise. Britain and France were ready to talk peace. Wilson was eager to mediate it. In August 1916, all the conditions had come together to end the First World War, and by the way, prevent America from having to become involved. Why didn't it happen? That's the story I try to tell in The Road Less Traveled, working in British sources, German sources, French materials, and the American sources. What I wanna dwell on just a little bit for this American audience, is to talk a little bit about the American version of the story of how they got into World War I and how that's changed over the years. Let me start that off with a few slides for you. Um, so we all have a, a learned in school a story about why the United States broke its historic tradition of neutrality and entered the Great War. Think about it. In 1917, in its 141 year history, the United States of America had never sent a single soldier or sailor or Marine to fight on the continent of Europe. By the end of 1918, 2 million Americans out of a population of 100 million would be in Europe to join the war. Absolute historic break in American history. Why did it happen? The story back then is that, well, the Germans having restrained their submarine warfare at American request and agreed to restrain, restrict submarine warfare, decided to go to unrestricted submarine warfare in January, 1917. And when the Germans went to unrestricted submarine warfare, expecting America to join the war. America therefore broke diplomatic relations with Germany because Germany threw off the constraints on submarine warfare and provoked the United States to join the war. That was the story then. After the war was over in the subsequent years, the next draft of history came along. This draft of history was suspicious of the whole story of submarine warfare. And it tended to be a story that blamed merchants of death, businessmen, Wall Street, who they think because they'd made lots of loans to the allies had finagled the Wilson administration in the Senate to join a war that by the 1930s, Americans regarded as having been a mistake. Then came World War II. After World War II, Americans tended to think that the war with Germany had probably been right because surely Prussian militarism had been a danger. They had just fought another war to defeat it, after all. So therefore, in the years, in the decades after World War II, American history books tended to revert back to the original story, the story that emphasized the German decision to go to unrestricted submarine warfare. The argument that I make in my book is that neither of these stories are really the main story. The main reason the Germans went to unrestricted submarine warfare, the main reason America then broke off the diplomatic relations is because five months of peace talks had failed. There is in fact a whole secret understory in the prelude to the war. 
from August 1916 to the end of January 1917. There had been negotiations involving Britain, Germany, and above all, the United States to try to end the First World War. It was only when the Germans gave up on those negotiations that they then chose submarine warfare as their only other way to try to end the war. They chose submarine warfare because the peace talks had failed. Wilson did not understand why the peace talks had failed at the time or later and was bewildered that the Germans had done what they had done. And that puzzle, why did the peace talks fail? Why did the secret German peace move fail? Is what drives the story in my book, which I think reveals one of the great pivots, not only of American history, but of world history. In this secret understory, first, understand the Germans also were desperate to end the war and were willing to to negotiate a compromise peace, volunteering right at the outset to restore Belgium, for example, in order to end the war right then. Germany ended up widening the war in early 1917 because Wilson could not arrange a peace conference to end it. In other words, the war path was chosen because the peace path failed. The road less traveled failed. And that then is the story that I tell in my book. It's, it's actually not, it's a tragedy, of course, but it's much more interesting than that because we have this image of people, these leaders locked in a mindless struggle, the trench warfare, the meaningless offensives, and the leaders to us seem blind. But in fact, they did try to end the war. They tried really hard in the midway point. And so the great story here is of their heroic effort to try to end the war and how tantalizingly close they came to doing it because all the circumstances were actually in alignment to end it. Just to briefly review for you the situation in 1916, two years into the war, then the greatest war on the largest scale that had ever been fought in the history of the world a war that was beyond the human experience of anyone then living or any national histories. The war in 1916 was firmly stalemated. Each side had tried its plans to win the war in 1914, 1915, and even a final gasp in 1916, all of the plans had failed. And none of the leading powers had any military plans that offered much prospect of winning the war anytime in the foreseeable future. America was the one great power still not engaged, neutral. And the American umpire then moved to mediate a peace in 1916. All of this was in secret. And by the way, there was a great precedent for it that everyone at the time was aware of and remembered. Why, only 10 years earlier, the last great power war between Russia and Japan in 1904 and 1905 had been mediated to a peace, negotiated and convened by the American president at the time, Theodore Roosevelt. Now Woodrow Wilson was in the position of trying to follow that example. So that's the situation in 1916. Just to remind you some of the key players, President Wilson, who's looking to a Congress that is mostly divided between a pacifist camp that wants to stay out, an interventionist camp that wants to get in, but the dominant middle, and the dominant middle wanted to stay out of the war, but felt that the Germans should not engage in unrestricted submarine warfare. He's got his Secretary of State, whom he largely regards as a handsome, intelligent clerk. His Secretary of War, Newton Baker, an Ohioan, by the way, former mayor of Cleveland, Ohio, Secretary of the Navy, a North Carolina newspaper editor named Josephus Daniels. But the main source of advice Wilson relied on for foreign policy is this man, an expatriate Texan living in the Northeast named Edward House, a private citizen, actually, 
who had become an advisor to Wilson uh, all through his first term in office. Living in New York City, actually, and taking the train occasionally to Washington, D.C. to confer with his good friend, the president, and then occasionally making trips to Europe. Here's a picture of Wilson and House walking together. House had a quiet, reserved manner. Um, one witness recalls that House had the kind of manner of someone talking to you quietly in a cathedral. He was no great foreign policy mind himself, but he was a great listener to other people and would channel and um, synthesize their views. Uh, Wilson thought he was a useful, honest counselor, but did not think he had a first-class mind. Wilson, for the thinking, relied almost entirely on himself. Wilson made his move, by the way, to uh, try to negotiate peace literally the first day in his office back from his reelection in the middle of November 1916. I want to sh share with you um, a page from the diary of Edward House. This is actually the page uh, House had a secretary who would type up his dictation. This is a diary entry for Tuesday, November 14th, 1916. This is one week after election day. Wilson's back in the office on Monday the 13th. His first full day after that, his first day he tells House to come to Washington. Read with me this diary entry. I left New York this morning, arriving at the White House. The president immediately came to my room and we had a long conference. We went at once into the matter about which he called me to Washington. The president desires to write a note to the belligerents demanding that the war cease and he desired my opinion. His argument, is that unless we do this now, we must inevitably drift into war with Germany upon the submarine issue. He believes Germany is already doing bad submarine things, that's what he's referring to, and that in order to maintain our position, we must break off relations, which he postponed. But here's the key sentence, before doing this, he would like to make a move for peace hoping there is sufficient peace sentiment in the allied countries to make them consent. By the way, House is opposed to this, as he explains. Wilson down here was much worried over my position and asked me to think it over further. Then they went, he left for a little while and then they went back to it. They argued about this all that night and then all the next morning. Wilson insistent and urgent that he needed to make this move for peace. House keeps throwing him off, throwing him off because he doesn't want to offend the British because House doesn't realize that at this very moment, the British are also debating a desperate effort to end the war and their imminent bankruptcy and the dollars to pay for it. But House didn't know that. So he feared Wilson's move would offend the British when in fact, Wilson's timing would have been perfect the British. Wilson then decides to increase his pressure. The House throws Wilson off, various counter arguments urging him to wait. Wilson's impatient, decides to draft the peace move himself. And meanwhile, he tests his leverage over the Allied side, which was financial, by instructing through the Federal Reserve Board, very secretly, banks to quit making any unsecured loans to the Allies which effectively cuts off the flow of funds, new funds to the allies, they will run out of dollars in early 1917. Yet what actually happens is that in December, Wilson is persuaded not to actually call for a peace conference, but instead to write a much awaited note that simply asks the two sides to state their war aims. Both sides are equally bewildered by Wilson's note. And don't, why isn't he calling for a peace conference? Why does he ask us to state our war aims when obviously we can't say anything meaningful about that in public? Some of the Germans start giving up on Wilson at this point with the military side resurgent. But during late December and January, the talks actually revive in Washington. The diplomacy is underway. 
Bernstorff, the German ambassador, is helping to show House and Wilson how to cut the deal. But instead, Wilson, influenced by newspaper editors, decides instead to give a speech calling for a peace without victory, calling for a compromise peace, but instead, rather than turning that into a peace conference call, a diplomatic action, he sets it up in a lofty way as conditions by which America will help more bewilderment on all sides. But the talks revive again. Finally, the Ger Wilson says, well, send me your terms. Send me the terms Germany will consent. They've been telling him their terms for months, but they finally send two messages, one saying that they're going to resume unrestricted submarine warfare, but another message complying with Wilson's request and sharing with him their, the, the compromise terms they would take into peace talks. Wilson and House, angered by the submarine move, scorn, throw aside the German chancellor's confidential message confiding his terms, break off relations with Germany, and then Wilson realizes he has no one left with whom he can talk peace, he never calls for the peace conference. The opportunity fades away. The book tells the story in all of its human detail. And the tragedy is then that the world descends into a spiral of wider and wider war. America pulled in. America then providing all the dollars that the, to continue the war that the allies no longer had. Russia implodes, so the Germans are encouraged to continue the war widens, Europe and the Middle East descend into violent chaos and civil war from which an unsatisfactory peace in 1919 can barely salvage the world, poisoning the atmosphere and setting up the conditions that will lead to another world war 20 years later. So, what I want to do then is just come back to um, the heroism and tragedy of this book and the human story it tells. We have this image of inexorable war, but it wasn't. The book spends a lot of time on the British leaders, on the German leaders who are trying to find the way out. The heroic leaders who actually are willing to compromise, willing to look at a way out, German, British, French, and Wilson, who sees that a peace without victory is the right way to do it, but he doesn't quite know how to conduct the negotiation. He's frustrated and delayed by a dissembling and amateurish advisor on whom he relies too much. The moment is there, the terms are all coming together, yet the moment fades and passes and we reach a turning point in world history. That's the fascinating story that I tell in the book, but what really brings the story to life are the people. Um, the people, the designs, the way they come together, it's really a book that's designed to demystify and give you a window into here's how statecraft really works. Here's how it could have worked to change the whole course of world history and here are the ways in which it went wrong, and here are the consequences. Um, I think it's one of the most remarkable history stories uh, I've ever worked on in my long career, and I invite all of you to share it. Okay, that sounds great. So did you, we'll take some questions here. Um, we have some questions, so in case you wanted to ask something for the author, uh, there's the Q&A in the chat window there on the left-hand side in the bottom, so go ahead and start asking questions. We have one from Brad, and he asks about uh, Wilson, President Wilson. Did he want harsh sanctions on Germany during the Treaty of Versailles? Um, that's uh, a few years later than the period I discuss in my book, but it, at the uh, peace of Versailles, uh, Wilson was not in favor of, of a harsh victor's peace. He feared, actually, during the period I write about, he feared that if America joined the war, you would end up with a victor's peace. And in his view, quite wisely, a victor's peace would end up being no good peace at all. Um, the victors would be too harsh. The defeated would be too resentful. 
Um, you would create bitterness that would then feed the conditions for another war. He wrote this down, foresaw this in, the, in, the, in 1916, 17. And then because he failed then, he actually was doomed to live out the truth of his own prophecy. He then had to live through the imposition of a victor's peace, which he didn't want, but he was powerless to stop because the British and French demands were insistent. Uh, they were the ones who were living there in Europe, um, and he could not deflect them. Uh, the armistice terms had been concluded in a way, that's another detailed story, in which uh, the Germans had no leverage to be able to resist the British and French demands. And therefore, you get the, uh, the unsatisfactory peace of Versailles. But uh, myself, I'm, I actually don't share the critique that the peace was doomed because it was so harsh. I don't share that thesis alone. My view okay. is that the, the problem that because the war went on for the other two years, because Russia had dissolved into civil war, the Middle East had collapsed, Central Europe was imploding into revolution. The situation was so bad that there is no group of peacemakers who at that point could have patched it up successfully. In a way, they did the best they could um, in an extremely bad, chaotic, apocalyptic situation. That's why I pull the story back to the point that I think really where you could have averted this. And that was the failure to end the war at the midway point before it widened and went off the precipice. Hmm. Well, those are some great points. Um, John asks about the Zimmerman telegram, which you mentioned in the book. Uh, where does that fit into the whole story here during the peace process? Uh, actually, it comes after. Uh, this, my story has already ended before the Zimmerman telegram is released. So the Zimmerman telegram, here's what happens. At the time, the Germans uh, send the message to be delivered to the Americans that says that they're going to resume unrestricted submarine warfare. They fear, the Germans, that that may tr provoke the Americans into war. So, uh, some Ger so a German uh, official named Zimmermann wrote a message to be sent on to Mexico. And in that message, they promised the Mexicans that if they if America goes to war with Germany, and if Mexico joins with Germany, then Mexico will be treated well in the peace and given all sorts of nice things that it lost in the Mexican War. All right. So the Germans send this awful message to the Mexicans at the end of January when they send the message that could escalate submarine warfare and that risks war. But Wilson does not know about this message at the time he breaks off relations with Germany. He doesn't know about this. So at the time he basically, at the time the peace talks fail, no one knows about the Zimmerman telegram. Relations with Germany are broken off on February 1st, 1917. Now, after February 1st, Wilson still doesn't want to go into the war. So weeks pass after that in which Wilson is trying to figure out some way in which to avoid going into the war, even though he's already broken off relations with Germany, he's ended the peace talks. He sent the German ambassador home. He has, he's basically burnt his bridges, but he still, he still is reluctant to take the war road. That's the point at which the British leak the Zimmerman telegram, which they had intercepted. Their intelligence had intercepted the Zimmerman telegram. They had broken the German diplomatic code. And then they leaked the Zimmerman telegram into the American press in order to push Wilson into going ahead and declaring war on Germany. So the telegram leaks out at the end of February, weeks after relations have been broken off, weeks after the peace talks have, have been lost. And then, of course, the pressure does mount on Wilson to proceed and go ahead and declare war on Germany and is an important uh, force pushing Wilson to go ahead and make that move. But at that point, Wilson had very few choices left anyway, because he'd already sent the Germans home and cut off the peace talks. But that's the kind of the, the British had waited a little bit trying to figure out a way they could leak the Zimmerman telegram without revealing that the reason they had intercepted the telegram 
was because they had broken these codes and were actually uh, reading the transatlantic cables that the Americans were using for their own diplomatic messages. But they figured out a way to leak that information without showing that they were intercepting those messages. Mm. So, long story, but bottom line is Zimmerman telegram is important, but it's not really, it's not a key event in my story. Uh, we have a question from somebody that asks about uh, Wilson and House. Why was Wilson taking advice from House since he was just sort of a private citizen that you mentioned during your talk? Well, th this is actually the relationship between Woodrow Wilson and Edward House is one of the great mysteries. Um, in fact, uh, the greatest psychiatrist in the world, the most famous psychiatrist in the world named Sigmund Freud, actually once co-wrote a book on the Wilson House relationship using his talents to try to decipher the mystery. Uh, I think without success, actually. Um, but now back to your question, why the relationship? Um, Wilson was a man who had a very small inner circle. Uh, he um, had relied very much on his first wife uh, for advice. Uh, his, um, and he, uh, had had a very close friend at Princeton from whom he had become alienated in battles when he was the president of Princeton. Just as Wilson is becoming elected, uh, he meets House, who's a, um, a well-known advisor about Democratic Party politics and patronage. Um, he'd, been a prom he'd been prominent in Texas politics back when he lived in Texas before he moved east. Um, House and Wilson struck up a friendship around the time Wilson was elected to the presidency through Democratic Party politics and talking about patronage. And Wilson found that uh, House was receptive, admiring, uh, confidential, and a good judge of people, yet was also a civilized gentleman yet also politically very interested and shared a lot of Wilson's political goals. So that, and then Wilson kind of fastened on him as uh, his kind of his best, really his best friend outside of his, uh, outside of his wife. Wilson's first wife died, um, shattering Wilson, by the way, after, in 1914. Wilson then remarried at the end of 1915 and ended up relying on his second wife quite a lot too. Um, but here's House still playing an important role in this circle. Mainly, House's role was as a sounding board and confidant, mainly on personnel choices and patronage issues. Mainly not so much on policy stuff, with the one exception of these European political issues, because House had been kind of doing the grand tour in Europe every year for years, and had sort of become, um, or affected to become, um, Wilson's conduit into the great houses of Europe, and especially in London. Another factor, Wilson no longer trusted his ambassadors. He did not trust his ambassador in London because his ambassador was too pro-British. He did not trust his ambassador in Berlin because the ambassador was a Tammany Hall politico and also a kind of an impulsive temperamental figure. Wilson did not reach out to or trust the British or French ambassadors in Washington because of because they had been so close to Theodore Roosevelt, who was the most prominent Wilson hater in America. <laughs> he actually, everyone liked Bernstorff, the German ambassador. So there was a decent relationship there. But you ask kind of why is Wilson relying so much on the house? And that's part of the reason, but it's also part of the weaknesses of this really quite small American government at the time. Uh, Wilson's secretary of state um, is not a person whom Wilson respects as an intellectual or as a thinker. He's really just a person who brings cables over and takes them away at the end of the day. Okay, we have a little bit of a, it looks like a follow-up question to that. And um, Kirk asks, Wilson's competency in foreign relations is weak at best. Uh, was Wilson a good judge of character in selecting his own cabinet during both his administrations? Um, you know, the, 
the book is very hard on Wilson in some ways and certainly holds Wilson centrally responsible for the colossal diplomatic failure at the heart of the story. I think the largest diplomatic and most consequential diplomatic failure in the entire history of the United States. Uh, it's a big statement, but I think that's true. So as hard as we, I am on Wilson though, the, the tragic side of it is, is I actually think Wilson in many ways is an extremely capable and perceptive person. I think that if you read the book, I think you'll actually be struck by how wise Wilson is in so many ways. At the level of the big picture, he is a deep thinker. He does have a, uh, a careful, balanced perspective on world politics. He is, in some respects, a good judge of people and policies. Incidentally, a, a, some of the members of his cabinet are outstanding choices. His Secretary of War had been too militarist for Wilson's taste. And so in early 1916, Wilson replaced his Secretary of War with Newton Baker, the former mayor of Cleveland, Ohio. And Newton Baker was an outstanding, turned out to be an outstanding choice, Secretary of War. Um, some of the other choices, not so good. Um, as Secretary of the Treasury, um, Wilson had a man named William McAdoo, who was also uh, the husband of his daughter, one of his daughters. <laughs> so, and McAdoo had presidential aspirations of his own. Um, some of the cabinet members, very good. Some kind of political patronage. Wilson, above all, trusted and relied on his own judgment. He wrote his own speeches. Um, he had never really gotten used, you see. He was new to government. In a way, he'd become a very successful governor of New Jersey after being president of Princeton, but had only been governor of New Jersey for a short time before being catapulted to the highest office in the land. So he was not a person used to administering a large public organization. Um, he was, uh, therefore, in a way, uh, an extremely thoughtful, wise um, academic and teacher. He was very gifted in how to judge politics in Congress. So if you brought him a bill and you said, here are the different sides on the bill, he had very good judgment about where to strike the compromise, how to forge the coalition. He could react to ideas that others would bring to him, often very shrewdly. For instance, on the eight hour wage bill that was passed during 1916. But on this foreign policy issue, Will others were not doing the staff work for him. Others were not writing the bill. The coalitions weren't already in place. He had to craft the peace conference move himself, and he, he just didn't know how to do it. And he relied for an advice on a dilettantish amateur who also didn't really quite know how to do it, though he certainly didn't admit his ignorance. Towards the end of the story, you'll see that actually... Wilson is de facto getting his advice on what to do, not from anyone in his own government, but from the German ambassador, a British intelligence agent, and finally, at the end, even his humanitar a humanitarian relief coordinator named Herbert Hoover, are all actually giving quite good advice on how to do this, and which Wilson is struggling to process when his time runs out. One of the things I found really interesting about your book is you mentioned sort of the end, uh, the peace option fails at 1917. It's not on the table anymore, but you make the point that the United States doesn't need to get into the war. I think you say entry was unnecessary. Can you kind of talk a little bit about that? What do you mean? Yeah, there was actually, um, there was no urgent necessity for America to enter World War I right away. America was not directly threatened. Um, the German, uh, so it was not, un, it was, um, it was unnecessary for, at a couple of levels. One, it was unnecessary because instead America could have negotiated a peace. As the book, I think, documents in detail, if the, the peace mediation opportunities were there, I kind of map out how it could have been done. I have worked as a diplomat in a number of situations of war and peace. And I map out how it could have been. And I think any professional diplomat reading my book will recognize the pathways. Um, so it's on, you don't need to go to war if instead you can make peace. 
and the peace path is right there, but it, it, was, it is the road less traveled. All right, so that's unnecessary at that level. Unnecessary then also because even at the time Germany, giving up on Wilson, the military anyway, moves to unrestricted submarine warfare, Bettmann still offers him ways to keep the peace path open and Wilson doesn't see it. He's so, uh, he, he lets his emotional reaction to the German submarine move color his reaction to the move the chancellor is making to keep peace alive and breaks off relations with Germany. That was unnecessary. He could have kept the peace talks going, threatening Germany to come to the peace conference and offer to restore Belgium and stop the submarine warfare. And the Germans had promised that if a peace, the moment a peace conference was convened, they would stop the submarine warfare. So he, there was a, a road there. Also, um, if you had kept the peace talks alive, America didn't need to be in a hurry to declare war because there was nothing the submarine warfare would do that would plunge America necessarily into the war right away. But here's what happened instead. By sending the Germans home, you basically burnt the bridges to continue the peace talks. Wilson doesn't want to go to war, but in a way he does, he's cut off his options. Then the Zimmerman telegram is released and he's being bombarded with pressure to stand up for American honor. Okay, now American ships start to get sunk. Americans are drowning. Um, the clamor rises and he doesn't have any alternative left because he's sent the Germans home. And that at that level, the situation, I think, shows how unnecessary war was. Um, it's true that once you, if, if you don't know about the peace option, the war option might look necessary. And so to many historians, many Americans, and even historians who study this period, uh, and many who studied it after World War II, it looked like World War I was necessary after all, because the Germans had done these bad things. But that's because they didn't fully realize that the peace road had always been there. If you don't know about the peace road, the war looks more necessary. And that's in a way why the book says that, no, actually really the war was unnecessary. And I reinforce that by studying this, not just from the American point of view, but especially from the British point of view and the German point of view, and even the French point of view as well. That's great, thank you. Uh, we have a question from Michelle, and she asks, what aspects of Wilson's personality brought about the outcome, that would be the failure of the peace outcome, and how is his failings informing modern leaders in their politics today? Well, um, the, his failure doesn't inform modern leaders today because, of course, they don't know what happened because they can't have read my book. Um, <clears throat> I have to, if you'll allow me to digress, my, my book, uh, if it's kind of odd that my book should exist. My book should have been written 40 years ago by somebody else. That is, the evidence available to put this piece, this story together and describe this and show how the statecraft could have worked has actually been available for other historians for, uh, I think, more than a generation. There, you can get into a discussion of what evidence was really needed to complete the jigsaw puzzle. But I think at least since the early 1980s. But historians, partly because they, they weren't comparing across all the different national archives, didn't really put the story together. They thought the story had been, been there, done that, story's already been told, no need to revisit it. Um, now that's why, therefore, to come back to the question, Statesmen today aren't informed by that failure because that book hadn't been written yet. But to take the question a little deeper, um, they should be informed by the failure because the failure shows ways how wars can be ended, not just how wars can be started. Now in my public life, I'm not famous for being a pacifist. I'm kind of, I'm as regarded generally as a centrist. But I, this is a book about how war could have been avoided and how people use words like diplomacy and they say diplomacy is good, but mostly the eyes kind of glaze over when someone says diplomacy. 
All right, think about it as a, just a colossal problem. How do I end this terrible war? I've got good news for you. People actually tried to end it. They actually tried to solve this problem, and I show you how. And you said, gee, how would I go about ending a giant war that should be stopped and saved? Money? There actually is a way to do it, and I show you how. And I show you actually how close people came to doing it. That's an exciting story. It's an exciting story is how you can solve, how they could have solved and came so close to solving one of the biggest problems human history has encountered in the last 150 years. So that could be instructive to states, statesmen and stateswomen today. Okay, great. We have a question from Barbara, and she asks, did Wilson understand the story as you now see it, or was he totally oblivious to what could have been? Um, he did not understand it. Uh, this, is this is just fascinating, Barbara. Um, he, he thought, uh, at the time, that he thought he was completely bewildered by the German notes. He's got this one message that... Um, De declares unrestricted submarine warfare. And then he gets this other message from the chancellor sharing the German peace terms so that peace talks can continue. He reacts so strongly to the public resumption of submarine warfare, which ostentatiously crosses the line he had set down the previous year, that he almost, he, he and the house brush aside the chancellor's peace message and focus on the submarine business. But he's bewildered. He thinks, and he says, and House writes it in his diary, he thought he was just a few weeks away from convening a peace conference that would end the war. He doesn't understand what had gone wrong. He, does, he doesn't understand why the Germans had given up on him after five months of trying. He doesn't understand, see, he doesn't understand the moves that he has made that were wrong. He doesn't know how he, he doesn't quite realize how he screwed up the peacemaking in November and December and in January because he doesn't know what he did wrong. He comments to House at, uh, as this is all happening. He says, he's so stunned. He says, I feel like the world is completely disordered. The world is upside down. I feel like he says, as if the world has suddenly started turning on its axis in the opposite direction. So that instead of the sun rising in the east and setting in the west, instead the earth is now rotating from west to east. He says, I, can't, I cannot get my footing. And he's stunned and depressed all day long because he's bewildered as to what has happened. He doesn't want to go into the war. He's impulsively and too quickly, rashly broken off relations with Germany and sent the German ambassador home. And then stunned, depressed, and bewildered, spends weeks trying to find a way out of the corner in which he finds himself and can't find a way out. Fascinating. So we have a question um, from C.G. Young, and he asks, could you please give us your thoughts on the famous Barbara Truckin's book, The Guns of August, and Shaw's play, Bury the Dead, as their significant works on the war, their historiography, if you will? Sure. Um, Barbara Tuckman actually uh, was fascinated by the World War I era. And for those of you who love reading history, um, and I tried to write this book as a book for people who like reading history and just like a wonderful story with tremendous characters. Um, and if you're that kind of person who likes that kind of book, Barbara Tuckman wrote some great ones. She wrote three books that are deeply concerned with the First World War. Um, not necessarily in this order. Um, the first of them was called the Proud, the first one is called the Proud Tower about Europe before World War I. It's a wonderful set of portraits of different kinds of European figures um, and one American figure too, set in the 1890s and early 1900s. Then uh, she wrote her most famous book, um, The Guns of August, the one you mentioned. Um, at the beginning of the 1960s um, as a way of describing the, it was one of the many books that were describing the outbreak of war in July and August, 1914. But she spent some time on the opening campaigns and the transition from the idyllic peace 
in the summer of 1914 to suddenly all these armies moving. And the argument that she made, which influenced a lot of people at the time, was that the war was set in motion by the operations of machine, of a machinery of mobilization that the leaders had not understood, that they found themselves trapped by that machinery of mobilization. And that was a lesson that the president at the time, John F. Kennedy, took very much to heart, that he should not be trapped by a machinery of mobilization that he did not understand or control. And that was actually a lesson he carried with him and may have helped save us from war in the Cuban Missile Crisis. Tuckman also wrote a book just about the Zimmerman telegram story, actually, because just as a small book, fascinating story. Her work on that has now been superseded by a historian named Thomas Boghart, who has had access now to the uh, uh, secret intelligence files in the British government that shed a lot of light on this issue that was not available to Tuckman at the time she wrote her book on the Zimmerman telegram. But it is a rat good story. Um, I want to come back, though, to the impact of the guns of August and what I hope will be the impact of the road less traveled. Because in a way, I'm trying to follow in, in Barbara Tuckman's footsteps. She wrote about how leaders should not be trapped by the machinery of mobilization into a war they did not want. I'm writing about how statesmen should not be trapped into conflict or even a war because they don't understand how to do the statecraft. And so my book in a way is a cautionary roadmap of here is how the statecraft could have been done and could well be done again if people will take the trouble to understand how to get on what I call the road less traveled. So in a way, my book is an illustration of how to get on just those sorts of roads now and in the future. Okay, great. We have time for one last question, and it involves Britain. You talk a lot about France and Britain, and of course, the United States and Germany, but Britain was really desperate. Britain was running out of money. If they did, in fact, run out of money in 1917, like you mentioned in your book, do you think they would have absolutely went to the peace table, or would they and Lloyd George sort of fight to the end? Actually, fighting to the end was not going to be much of an option for them. Um, the uh, dollar bankruptcy would have curbed the Allied war effort um, so substantially that maintaining campaigns on the scale of the past would simply have been impossible. Um, in a way, uh, of course, Lloyd George in the short run was really lucky that the Germans screwed up on their end and Wilson screwed up on his end and America came into the war because otherwise Britain would have lost the war in 1917. They would have run out, they would have become bankrupt in the dollars to sustain the Allied war effort by the spring of 1917. They almost got battered out of the war anyway, simply by the failures of all their offensives. Remember, in 1917, the French launch a giant offensive that collapses and leads to the mutiny of the French army. The, the British launch a giant offensive that turns into the bloody mud of Passchendaele and is another catastrophic failure. The Italians launch an offensive that turns out so badly that the Italian front practically collapses and, and Italy is practically knocked out of the war in the fall of 1917. And the Russian, the new Russian government after the revolution trying to stay in the war, then launches a failed offensive of its own in the summer of 1917 that also that causes Russia to collapse and allows the Bolsheviks to take over. So now imagine America's not into the war, all those things happen and Britain is bankrupt in, in, the, in, the, in a huge part of their war effort. That's the situation Britain would have found itself in. Then it would have been, it would have of course been going to the peace table, but under even worse circumstances. But because America comes in, they get a flood of dollars and a flood of doughboys heading to France. Um, so it's a, uh, now in the, in the short run, you could say that uh, Lloyd George got lucky. Um, in the long run though, and taking the larger historical perspective, my argument, which I think may be controversial in Britain, but I think is right. My argument is that Britain actually would have been better off to end the war at the end of 1916 anyway, if they could have gotten a compromise peace 
and the Germans left Belgium. Because in a way, Britain and France winning, they lost the war almost by the way they won it. The, the, the subsequent loss of life and the debts that they incurred left them in such a ruinous condition that they were also doomed to financial instability and difficulties uh, for the following generation. So everyone, even the nominal victors, would have been better off if the war had ended at the end of 1916. Okay, great. Thank you so much for coming out to talk about The Road Less Traveled, Mr. Zlikolakov. This is a fantastic book, and I love World War I, so I'm glad this can go along on my shelf tonight. So thanks to all you and Zoom land coming out to listen, uh, and hopes everybody stays safe out there. Take care. Thank you again.